Well, first of all, thank you very much, Doug, for uh, laying that foundation. And hopefully I'm going to pick up um, pretty much where you left off. Um, I should apologise to begin with. Um, I had a cataract operation a, a little while ago. I know, I'm way too young. Um, but um, if, if I start sort of squinting and doing weird things, I haven't developed a nervous twitch. I'm just trying to sort of focus. Actually, I have developed a nervous twitch. But no, that's just not what it is. I'm just trying to uh, see what's on my screen. Um, Doug's words were really important for uh, the simple fact that today really is about Jesus. It's not about techniques. And I hope you're not here to learn techniques. That's not really what today uh, is intended to do. It is intended, however, to uh, ensure that the foundation for our teaching is Jesus. That Jesus is, uh, in many ways, the answer to everything. Uh, we, we kind of get round to that conclusion the more, we, the more we explore these kinds of ideas. So I'd like to suggest that uh, in the book of Acts, what we see is that very foundation of Jesus' teaching um, uh, emerging through the way the earliest Christians taught. Um, I think Luke's characters are very much modelled on Jesus in the book of Acts. Um, on the handout, I've suggested uh, how um, Stephen's life is very much modelled on Jesus, uh, particularly his martyrdom, but Luke does the same things with Peter, the same things with Paul. Uh, he wants the early Christian believers to realize that those in charge of their communities are people whose lives were very much uh, inspired by the life of Jesus. So even as far as forgiving uh, their uh, murderers, um, uh, both Jesus and Stephen uh, ask the Lord to forgive the people who were killing them. They both at the end of their life, Jesus, that wonderful reflection on Psalm 31, verse 5, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Same thing we see uh, Stephen there saying. Luke uh, extends this idea uh, of, of the, the uh, teaching in the early church being based on Jesus by beginning his uh, second volume, the book of Acts, uh, with a verse on teaching. He's reminding Theophilus of all that Jesus did and taught. Then he ends the book of Acts, the very last line of Acts. is all about Paul and the house arrest, but being free enough to teach. He bookends the book of Acts with teaching. The entire uh, book, in many ways, is all about how these Christian ministries, uh, missionaries, planted churches and then galvanized and strengthened these communities through their teaching. So what is it that Luke is doing for Theophilus? Theophilus, this person to whom the uh, third gospel and the book of Acts was written, uh, is someone who has heard about the faith, and now his faith needs galvanizing. It needs strengthening. He wants to be uh, instructed in those things which he's been taught. Uh, to quote Luke, he says in Luke 1 verse 4, um, his objective was to teach Theophilus the exact truth about those things you have been taught. And you all know those kind of questions that you had when you were converted, right? You knew what we sometimes call the basics, but now your, strength, your, your, your faith needs strengthening. It needs deepening. It needs galvanizing. You want to be able to be uh, independent in some sense in your faith. You want to be able to stand on the foundation of what you believe, not what X, Y, and Z uh, believe. And in many ways, this is the position that we find ourselves in as people who are passionate about the teaching ministry. We want to be able to deepen and strengthen and galvanize the faith of other believers. And of course, that begins with ourselves. So I want to suggest three things. Um, if uh, you're, you're, you find yourself... Um, just remember these three takeaways. That firstly, teaching is a major time investment. Yeah. Secondly, uh, that um, we must, as teachers, have a commitment to telling the Christian story. And thirdly, teachers must be boundary pushers. Mm -hmm. Teaching the time investment, we know from that famous passage in Acts 5.42 uh, that they taught every day. That famous passage um, that, uh, that we know from God, the Gospel, where in Acts 11, where the followers of the way were called Christians for the first time. What were they doing there? What is it that Barnabas brought Paul to Antioch to do? To spend a whole year doing what? 
doing teaching. When Paul established a Christian community at Corinth, we're told in Acts 18 verse 11 that he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So great was Paul's commitment to teaching that in his um, dialogue with Festus, we read, while Paul was stating these things in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. Paul was so committed to learning so he could teach. It looked like he was going mad. Now, I'm not suggesting that we go nuts. Um, if you're nuts already, that's fine. But um, I've had several discussions with people who lead churches over the years. Um, and the time investment in learning what it takes to teach is so often seen as a kind of distraction from the ministry. My own view would almost be that it's the opposite. Uh, that to be a church teacher, and I'm not talking about um, roles and offices and having titles, but to be someone who teaches in a church and takes on that responsibility, in my view, requires rigorous learning and a real willingness to go out of your way, not only to teach, but to learn so that you can teach, whether that's to end up addressing the questions of individuals or speaking to roomfuls of hundreds of people. And I'm not even suggesting necessarily that you need to go and get formally trained in some institution, in some uh, university or seminary, but you must have a rigorous commitment to learning and that takes time. And that completion, that's not time taken away from the ministry. This is sometimes the impression I've got that you have the ministry over here, this really important stuff that you do, and then, uh, uh, yeah, just have your, your, your quiet time. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. If you want to teach, it's a vital component of your ministry is deep study and contemplation. The second thing I want to suggest is a commitment to telling our story. And this for me is really important. One of the key uh, literary forms in the book of Acts are speeches. That one quarter of the book of Acts are speeches. And there's a whole body of study uh, dedicated to, to studying the speeches. We don't need to go into all of that. Suffice to say, there are, depending on how you count them, at least 24 speeches in the book of Acts. Some say 28, that's uh, based on another way of thinking about it. But certainly there are eight speeches by Peter, there are two by James, one by Stephen, that's the longest in Acts 7, that wonderful indictment of, uh, of Israel. Um, there were nine by Paul, and then there were four longish sort of speeches by non-Christian um, writers. Now, whilst it's really difficult to, to find some uh, connective thread between all those speeches, there are certainly a couple of things which stand out quite clearly uh, from those speeches which come from believers. And the first, and this is the one I really want to take away, is that they were all engaged in what is often referred to as a biblical theology. What do I mean by that? Effectively, that in these speeches by believers, they were constantly telling that overarching narrative of what it means that God created a people and wants a relationship with them. That story is told and retold throughout these speeches. And it's pivotal, the pivotal question, I think, that we as people with a passion to teach ought to ask is, what is our story and how do we tell it? In Peter's speech after the Pentecost, he told the story of the resurrection, drawing on Psalm 2, drawing on Psalm 110, drawing on Joel chapter 2. Stephen, in his recounting of Israel's story uh, in uh, Acts chapter 7, where he effectively says that Israel has this history of killing prophets, so killing Jesus was perfectly consistent with their history. Again, it draws on this whole sweep of Israelite history. It tells the story. Even in Paul's great speech on the Areopagus, he retells the story of creation to talk about what it means to seek God, even for people who didn't know they were seeking. All throughout the biblical narrative, we hear the words of storytellers who use stories to convey truth. When Nathan challenged David about his adultery with Bathsheba, he told this story of the, the guy with the one lamb, um, which was consumed uh, by this horrible chap who had several lambs. Um, Paul says that when he shared um, 
truth in Thessalonica, he didn't just share the gospel, he shared his very self, he shared his story. Our earliest brothers and sisters didn't have a Bible to study with people. What on earth would we have done in the first century without a nice, neatly bound New Testament to tell people what to do? So what did they do? How did they convert people with no Bible to study? They shared their story. They turned to their neighbour and they said, this is how Jesus changed me. He can do the same for you too. And of course, the master storyteller, as Doug's already pointed out, Jesus himself continually retold the story of Israel, of creation, as he talked about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like was Jesus' way of saying once upon a time. It was his way of introducing the idea that this is what it's going to look like when God becomes king. He told stories. Even when he confronted individuals like the woman at the well in John 4, he told her story and then she believed. You know, today, many people, especially the young, are understandably quite sceptical about institutions. They always think there's something dark and mysterious and murky going on behind closed doors, right? Where, where people are sort of pulling strings and having secret meetings and all sorts of weird things going on behind the scenes. Then they come out in front on stage and they all look wonderfully shiny and people go, hmm, what's going on? <laughs> then they hear about some scandal on Sky News. They think, aha, I knew it. Dodgy as the day is long. But what they're not sceptical about is human narratives. You sit down with someone, you sit down with the most impressive people in the world, you would be shocked, maybe you won't be shocked, most people's stories are kind of the same. Now, obviously the details are different. But what I mean is even the most impressive, the most together-looking people have some trauma that they've dealt with. They have some life-changing, some, some major event, some major corner they had to turn in their lives. And you realize at the end of all that, that people are just people, that we all have stories. I often see our grand narrative, our big story, and this is why I always teach it to young people, in seven movements, like seven acts of a play. Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, the spirit, the church, the return. And we're in that sort of penultimate age now, of the church and the spirit, and the, the last part of the story will be when Jesus returns. One scholar wrote this, throw a rule book at people's heads or offer them a list of doctrines and they can duck or avoid it or simply disagree and go away. Tell them a story, though, and you invite them to come into a different world. You invite them to share a worldview, or better still, a God view. That is what the parables are all about. They offer a worldview which quietly shatters their own. Stories determine how people see themselves and how they see the world. Stories determine how they experience God and the world and themselves and others. Great revolutionary movements have told stories about the past, the present, and the future. They've invited people to see themselves in that light, and people's lives have been changed. If that happens at a merely human level, how much more when it is God himself, the creator, breathing through his word? Mm. The teacher's role, in my view, is not to communicate rules, but to invite the hearer into the story of God and to demonstrate that that story is our story. I think there can be a tendency to become so woodenly attached to this idea of studying the Bible with people. And this is why I thought Doug's question about the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure you had some interesting conversations about that, was a really important one. But we have this idea of studying the Bible with people, and it, it can often just become this exercise in teaching people the terms and conditions about church membership rather than teaching the gospel. And as such, people know what boxes to tick in order to join churches, but they can't explain the Christian story. They can't articulate what the kingdom of God is or why it matters or why it's important. 
They can't explain why it is the death and resurrection of this Jew in the first century puts the entire world to rights. And it's the teacher's role to disambiguate those very ideas. But the final thing I want to suggest is that teachers ought to be boundary pushers. Uh, one of the key turning points in the book of Acts is chapter 13, where Paul becomes the main missionary voice and kind of takes over from Peter. Uh, indeed, uh, it's in this section where Saul kind of becomes Paul, if you know what I mean. Um, him and Barnabas are uh, attempting to convert this chap called um, Elamas, uh, and they're getting opposition from, um, uh, sorry, they're trying to convert Sergius Paulus, and they get opposition from a magician called Elamas. Uh, well, they, 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 they curse Elamas with blindness uh, and Sergius Paulus for him. That's the turn. He was like, okay, I believe you. Yep, he's blind. These guys are not mucking around. It was quite common for, uh, for, um, uh, for a client to take on the name of a patron, a uh, person who would support them for something that they had done for them. And in this case, that seemed to be what happened. Saul took on the name of his patron, Sergius Paulus. And of course, we read in Acts 13, uh, verse 9, Luke says, Saul, who was also called Paul, this major turning point we see. Then we get another one of these wonderful speeches, drawing upon the Hebrew Bible. Paul uh, draws upon the history of Israel to say that, yes, they came to the synagogues first, they came to teach the people of Israel first, but now that they've chosen to reject this message, now I go to the Gentiles, this major turning point in Israel's history. Uh, and he quotes from Isaiah 49, verse 6. This was the moment where he became that light to the Gentiles. But for Paul, pushing the boundaries out to take this Jewish message to the non-Jewish world, it probably would never have got there. Teachers, I think, have got to be bold explorers people who are dissatisfied with formulaic and uncreative thinking. Teachers ought to be those sorts of people who don't feel the need to protect themselves from new ideas, which can happen. Uh, and part of the way we protect ourselves from new ideas is to hide behind church conventions, right? <laughs> Big church conventions here, and we hide, and we have formulae, and we, we parrot those formulae uh, because it makes us feel good makes us feel that we're standing on sure ground. I've argued this case elsewhere. I've often wondered why it was that this, this elaborate story had to happen to, to bring this former persecutor, Saul, into the church. Was there no one already in the Christian movement who could take the message to the Gentiles? Why, why get this murderer, this, this, this psychopath, why bring him into the Christian movement? What on earth was wrong with Peter? Well, in Acts 10, we read the following. You all know the story. It was uh, this vision that Peter had. It says uh, in Acts 10, in verse 11, he saw the heaven open, something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. For I've never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was so... The voice from heaven, God's voice, says, get up, kill and eat. And what's Peter's response? Surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Peter was so attached to his Jewish ritual traditions that not even God could get him to break them. Just imagine that. Get up, kill and eat. Uh -uh, no way. Because God has says I should never kill and eat anything profane. Hey, could you imagine God? What am I, chopped liver? I am God. Get up, kill and eat. God was doing something new. Something Enigmatic, powerful, something boundary breaking, something status quo upsetting, taking this Jewish message to the non-Jewish world. And it required a much more maverick personality, someone who was willing to push boundaries, someone who was willing to ask the hard questions, someone who refused to hide behind conventions and traditions to take that message to the non-Jewish world. 
So with those three things uh, in mind, um, I'm sorry, I didn't write my questions on the handout. So um, either scribble them down in note form now or hopefully have a good memory. But I'd like to ask these questions by way of reflection. Firstly, simply, how would you describe your own investment in learning and teaching for the sake of the kingdom of God? Second thing I want to ask is how well do you know the Christian story? Could you articulate, and I've been asked this question, the whole world's a mess, right? All this sin and death and pain. And so God says, I know, I'll crucify a Jew. How do those two things go together? How does the death of a, of a random Jew in the backwater in Galilee solve the entire world's problems? How do we tell that grand narrative of the Christian story? How might you go about, and this dovetails nicely with Doug's question, I think, how would you go about trying to convert someone if you... Or would you simply say, sorry, Jack, no Bible? And finally, what indeed does being a boundary pusher mean to you? What do you think it's going to take for you to push boundaries? And what might be the hindrances, do you think, to pushing the kind of boundaries that I think a teacher ought to. Feel free to ask me if you didn't get all those questions, I'll obviously be here. But, sorry? The first question, yes. How would you describe your own investment in teaching and learning to become equipped to teach in God's kingdom? Okay, and on that note, we may go back to our discussions.